hello everyone. Uh, we'll just give it another minute or two uh, to have everybody try and get logged in and ready to go before we get started here. All right, well, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Rory Brady and I am the manager of Alberta Technology Staffing Operations. Thank you for joining today's session. It is exciting to see 174 people from around Canada registered for this event. I'm thrilled to bring together today's panel as we take an in-depth look at the critical ways technology is being leveraged across Canadian sectors and organizations to rapidly propel business and cultural transformation forward. Before we begin, I'd like to address a few housekeeping items. We will be recording today's webinar and it will be available for on-demand viewing. A follow-up email with the link to the recording will be shared post-event. We will also have a Q&A session at the end of the discussion as time permits, so please enter questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible before our allocated time is up. Your participation is important for us today, and we have four polling questions, and we encourage your engagement throughout. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our incredible panel. We'll start off with Mark Diner. Mark is Director of Information Services with United Way of Alberta Capital Region and leads a team dedicated to the organization's digital and data transformation. Working in the public service for more than two decades, his career has focused on applying technology and data to support drive improved economic and social environmental outcomes. Mark has held evolving positions of responsibility within the government of Alberta, in government services, Alberta Health, and the Ministry of Justice. He also held the role of CIO for the Ministry of Environment and Parks and Recreation. Next, we have Sean Guthrie, is Senior Director, Information Technology at the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association. In his role, he advocates for members' interests to the provincial and federal orders of government and other stakeholders. With over 20 years of IT experience, Sean has honed his leadership skills on developing an innovative, robust, and secure business technology environment while managing the overall technology strategy. He's very active in the technology community, serving on the National Board of the CIO Association of Canada and on Lightspeed Ventures CIO Innovation Advisory Network. Next, we have Tara, Tara Mulrooney, is Vice President of Technology and Innovation for the Edmonton International Airport. She is, she, is, she is responsible for enabling the innovation of the expansion for the airport and building an information-based platform using IoT, messaging, and data. Prior to her current role, Tara was a CTO for the Alberta Energy Regulator and successfully led the fir firm's digital transformation, resulting in several industry awards. Tara's approach to IT includes converting strategic plans into tactical reality by leveraging people, technology, and efficient processes. She concentrates on building high performing teams and providing a fun and inspiring professional work environment. Next, we have Marty Murray. Murray. Marty is the director of the business performance improvement practice for Protivity in Canada. He helps CFOs and finance executives transform their finance functions into a value added business partner. Clients appreciate his leadership and extensive financial experience which ranges from targeted process reviews to large transformative projects that include ERP enablement, shared services, and outsourcing. More recently, Marty has been working with clients to their finance, in their finance transma transformation journey to explore how they leverage the latest digital technologies such as robotics process automation and machine learning into their organizations. Now, before we get started, let's have a look at our first poll question. We're kicking off today's session by exploring the vital role technology played for companies in 2020 and the critical ways it's propelling businesses and cultural transformation moving forward. Let's begin with a question for our audience on just how 2020 amplified technology's value in the workplace. So our first poll question is, the role of technology has been elevated as a result of the pandemic. Which of the following has the most significant impact on your organization or industry? You should see five options on your screen the dynamic increase in the adoption of new digital technologies, the newfound realization around the strat strategic importance of technology, the shift to customer and employee interactions via all digital channels, the focus on digitally enhanced offerings, or all of the above. And we'll give you all a few seconds just to 
to chime in. And there you can see, thanks for everyone for the participation. Well, let's jump into our first topic. What are the main opportunities and challenges of using technology to enable cultural and business transformation? Why don't we have Mark lead us on this, but I'd also love to get Sean's take on this as well. Hello, everyone. Um, so to begin with, I'd like to focus on the main opportunities. And then once I think we explore those, we can look at some of the challenges with those. Um, and there, there are two main opportunities that I'd like to focus in on. Um, I think both of the ingredients that um, uh, came together that define these two opportunities have been in place for a while, but the pandemic, I believe, really accelerated uh, the, the, the going forward uh, opportunities with both of these. And I know we'll be exploring the role of the pandemic um, in, in, in a future question. Uh, uh, the two opportunities that I'd like to explore, first of all, is um, the opportunity about how we engage with with uh, our ecosystems. Um, and I again, I believe the pandemic has really accelerated that. Um, in the past, if you think about the uh, evolution of digital and IT over the let's say the last four decades, there's been a uh, there's been a series of events that ha that have led to, I believe where we are today. Uh, the internet, mobile, and and back a long time ago, the um, a focus in on backend automation and backend systems. Uh, what, where I believe that the real opportunity is coming comes to now is how we how we move to the front of the organization, the tip of the spear, let's say, and how we engage with employees, how we engage with our customers, even how we engage with systems, uh, ecosystems such as environmental systems. It could be it, it could be uh, how we engage with drones or sensors, or how we engage um, with uh, with land. And and uh, through through other remote sensing technologies, and so, um, and, and I think uh, that there's so many opportunities there. The when you think about um, how now restaurants engage with uh, diners, um, how retail is transformed, um, and in agriculture, uh, we're censoring up and we're creating a, a completely different experience with farming or with oil services. We're now uh, attaching sensors into the um, into the wellheads and being able to monitor the wear and tear of, of the mechanics of that as well. And so, as we think about the opportunity, thinking about now the engagement, the engagement that we're able to uh, bring forward, what what's that? What, what that is creating is all sorts of uh, new uh, data sources. And I think that is the um, opportunity, the second opportunity that I'd like to talk about, because now that we're engaging with sensors, with drones, we're engaging with our clients at the beginning of the um, new experience opportunities. We're creating a ton of data that we didn't have before, and with this, with with with, with this new data will come um, the ability to analyze and understand our organization like never before. And I think that's the second opportunity is around analytics. So. What does it mean in terms of our gut instincts with how our business is operating? Are we, with this data, is it, is it teaching us new things about the organizations? Um, is it changing our instincts and our, and our, and our behavior? Uh, what, is this, what is this onslaught of data teaching us about the organizations that we work for? Um, and so I think, I think that's where the real business transformation lay in the ability to understand our business with insight, to be able to engage with our customers and our ecosystem in ways that we haven't. I believe the pandemic has really accelerated those two opportunities. And I'd be really interested to, um, to analyze those as well. So I'm gonna ask Sean, um, from the AMA perspective, have you started to think about the data that you're collecting now that maybe you weren't collecting five years ago and what that means for your organization um, as an example to explore that opportunity as well? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a great question, Mark. And at, uh, you know, at, at AUMA, we have 
you know, a multitude of businesses in our services organization. And we have, you know, insurance, pensions, benefits, energy, utilities, and every single one of those uh, systems, those line of business systems have, um, you know, a number and an enormous amount of data. But what we've understood through the pandemic is the siloedness of that data. So that's actually, uh, we just were embarking right now on a, uh, um, on an application and data integration strategy and Deloitte's actually helping us with that. And the reason why we've engaged them is just the complexity of our business. We have so many lines of business. It's not like we're just an insurance company and have one main line of business. We need to integrate all the data that you talk about across all those different lines of business. And COVID really, you know, highlighted the struggles of that siloed data and that manual work required by all of our staff to, to put together those customer insights and that customer experience. So, you know, we believe that this roadmap and the strategy will really help set the stage, not only for us to have, you know, better customer insights and that 360 degree true view of a customer, but it will also help us with our RPA initiatives, with data warehousing initiatives, it's really that table stake. And so I'm, I'm thankful that as an organization, we've been putting an emphasis on that uh, because we really do realize that, um, you know, for our members, we want to provide that, you know, that, that rich, engaged customer experience. So here at the United Way, likewise, we're beginning to think about how we engage with our donors and how we uh, engage with the stakeholders that we invest in differently, and how we can collect better information uh, that would um, satisfy our, our donors and, and make them feel better and uh, more invested in their, in their investments um, to support the causes that they're interested in. In the case of the United Way, that's the elimination and eradication of poverty. Uh, we see data at being uh, at the center of this as well. But then with respect to the challenges, um, this does, th th this presents challenges as well, um, especially when you think about some of um, our investments and how do we, how do we know that we are uh, making an impact when many of the folks that um, we would, that would benefit from our investments may not have the ability to provide us through technology, the feedback that we'd be wishing to see. Um, many of the not-for-profits not that we deal, deal with have only a few staff, and it's very difficult for them to be able to uh, engage with us and leverage the technology assets that are available as well. So definitely from a, from a challenge perspective, there's an there's a uneven distribution of technology. There's a, a digital divide that we even now have as well, and uh, it's something that we're going to have to think about. Um, basic bandwidth. As uh, we've, we, we all have, have experienced the frozen screen um, as we've engaged, there are many communities that just don't have the bandwidth to engage as we, as, as we would like, or as, as, would, as, as the potential would offer us as well. So um, Sean, what about in terms of challenges that you're, you're seeing? Yeah, you know, I, I would I would go less on the technical side of things and uh, maybe I'll do it on more on the soft side is, you know, we've seen this this rate of change uh, has just been astronomical. The the pace pre pandemic versus now post pandemic, um, we've seen things where it took days and weeks to implement a solution right away um, to what it was pre pandemic was weeks, months and maybe years. So I think where the challenges are is how do we how do we rein it in? I don't think it's going to be we can't sustain where we're at right now. So I think that um, if you're going to undergo that, we need to as an as organizations need to figure out what is an acceptable rate of change. Uh, and then I'll I'll end off just on the last thing is I think that passion really um, you know in our in our positions as technology leaders, passion is what really helps us move these initiatives forward. But if we're like going at a breakneck speed, how do we sustain that passion? How do we sustain that love for what we do as technology leaders? I think that's gonna be a challenge and I don't have the answer for that, but that's something we will need to figure out. Yeah, I think pace of change is a huge issue for most organizations as well. Thank you for bringing that up. Well, that's great insight from, from both Mark and Sean, I appreciate it. And I'm sure that, that really resonates with probably a lot of people that are on, on the call today. 
Um, so, so thanks very much for, uh, for helping out on this particular topic. Well, um, why don't we jump to our next poll? Now, let's gain some pers perspective from our audience on, this, on the significant ways COVID has disrupted and influenced our cultural and societal behaviors in the workplace moving forward. So for our next poll question, what is the biggest cultural shift your organization has experienced since the start of the pandemic? You should see four options on your screen. People are working longer hours. There's a better work-life balance, increased flexibility in the workplace, or greater innovation within the company. And we'll give everyone a few seconds to, uh, to weigh in on this topic. All right, I think that gives everyone a chance. Yeah, good. thanks for everyone, good participation. So thanks very much, we really appreciate it. Well, let's jump into our next topic, which is what shifts are you seeing in your company's cultural and business transformation due to the pandemic and what's their impact post pandemic? Sean, I'd love for you to lead on this, but we'd also love to get Tara's take on it as well. Sean, can you kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a great question because I, you know, I think that this is an opportunity, this shift that CIOs or technology leaders have been looking for. Um, you know, I talked about passion. I think we've all been passionate, but we're looking for this outlet. And so I think, you know, CIOs or technology leaders are no no longer backroom operators. We've we've proved ourselves in the last, um, you know, in the last 14 plus months that that we can keep the lights on. We're good at that. But I think technology leaders have also stepped up and have led transformational changes in the face of adversity, this uncertainty, and in some cases led revenue generating opportunities as organizations have had to shift to stay alive in, in these uncertainty in so uncertain times. So, you know, one of the examples at AUMA was we've identified a gap within our member base uh, for them to procure affordable enterprise solutions. So we've we've shifted, at least from a technology perspective, instead of just focusing on delivering services for our internal customers, we've now created a new line of business within our services corporation to sell managed technology services to our members. And we started to uh, launch a managed IT service practice and you know what, we're starting to see this other shift where other, techni no, other technology leaders are starting to do this as well. And they're starting to add top line revenue to their organizations, which is fantastic. And I was just talking earlier with a, with a colleague and he's like, well, you're in IT. Well, yeah, I'm in IT, but now we're starting to generate revenue. And I think that is a fantastic shift that we're seeing at least internally within IT. So, you know, I would, uh, and I've got a couple other things, but on the same interest as uh, Mark, I'd love to hear what Tara has to think. I know um, there's been a lot of amazing things going on in Edmonton International Airport, and, and Tara, I'd love to see some, what are those shifts in your industry? Sure, thanks, Sean, um, for, for letting me chime in. Um, probably the thing that, from a cultural perspective, if I kind of start there, it's really about I, I think the significant increase we've seen in employee engagement, and I'm going to talk about performance from a team perspective at our executive level and below. Um, we actually just came out of our strategic retreat last week um, with our with our CEO and our executive team, and the the um, you know that forming, storming, norming, performing is really really true for the staff at EIA. Um, you know, we've always been, I think, a really close um, team with just an amazing culture. It's what attracted me to the organization. But now uh, we're able to make decisions in a much quicker way. Uh, we're much more aligned. Um, we have, um, I would say, tighter integration. And for us, um, you know, we through that discussion of how do we manage in, in our scarcity, because, uh, of course, we've had significant financial impacts. Uh, we've lost a third of our staff um, through this pandemic, unfortunately. But when we were looking at our capital plan and how we work together, um, you know, my VP of operations said to me, well, everything on your plan is my plan, right? So, so to, to your comment about sort of being at the table, um, I, I think we are. Um, I think what's going to be really important for us as professionals is how do we stay there 
and how do we de deliver the value and maybe provide more transparency and help educate our executive and bring them into our teams more effectively, right? I think every business now is a is a IT business, right? And how do we um, kind of let go of our egos a little bit and make sure that we're educating and bringing that executive team along? So, so that's kind of on the cultural. On the business side, aviation has just seen some you know massive shifts and it's still happening. So we've always looked at passenger experience, safety and security, right? But now it's all about health, right? So we are seeing business processes, requirements for screening, re requirements for temperature checks, for testing. And we've been able to, again, through that agility, create that first testing protocols in terminal for passengers and staff, um, partnering with Numi Health. So kind of jumping to that as an opportunity to build back passenger confidence. And we're gonna to continue to see uh, things that I think are good for, for our, our, our organization and for passengers, but also challenges with you know, potential health passports. Uh, what does that mean? Um, so lots of shifting that's happening, but, but I do think that from an ecosystem perspective, and Mark, I love that word. I, I love that you mentioned it earlier. Um, we're seeing a lot more collaboration and perhaps some movement on some positions that federal government and others have taken in the past to really look at streamlining and um, helping us manage those crowds, the social distancing and the other requirements. That's great. You know, I love Tara, how you talked about, you know, when you're getting into the cultural aspect and, and how, you know, I think this pandemic has really highlighted that that technology leaders are continuing to have as big a role in it within an organization when it comes to strategy and value creation. Um, I posted something, you know, a couple of weeks back when, you know, you see IT leaders that uh, talk about, you know, IT and, and the business. We, and then what I kind of joked in is we got to stop saying the business because we are the business. We are part of the business. So talking in third person really is, is silly, I think. So, um, you know, one of the challenges I wanted just to pivot quickly and, and, I'll, and I'll share just a minute is, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it as well, is with respect to cybersecurity. So all these things that, you know, that we have implemented so quickly, and I think in some cases we've kind of foregone um, cybersecurity and we've taken a backseat but now, as you keep seeing in the news, and it's never gone away, pre and post pandemic, is cybersecurity is something that we have to all be considering. I'm thinking that there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of organizations that are going to be going back and looking back at security solutions like, holy crap, we put this in place. Did we actually take into consideration all the security um, um, things that we need to look at? And, and I would assume no different at the airport. You guys live, work in a very secure environment. So, I mean, we'd love to hear what your take is on, on the cybersecurity front and the challenges that this has kind of posed. Yeah, yeah. So it's that, that's a great thing. And it's actually one of our top priorities um, is to really double down from a cyber perspective. And, and as you guys know, you know, starting with that framework and thinking about controls, not just technology. Um, I, you know, we have lots of technology. I'm sure all of you do. But um, I remember um, an incident at a won't be named organization where we experienced a ransomware attack. And it wasn't the um, tools that, that found it. It was um, you know, great service desk people who saw a problem and said, hey, something's happening. Empowered staff who escalated that there was a problem to the right people. And actually the person who saved the day um, was a, a server administrator who said, you know what, let's um, make our SAN storage read only and let's quarantine and stop and contain it. And, you know, when I think back to, when I think about cybersecurity and risk, so much of it is about empowerment and knowledge and um, making sure that your teams understand the current threat levels, making sure you practice and think about those really procedural things that you can do when you're attacked, because it's not an if, it's a when, it's an it's it will occur, right? And then empowering and rewarding people. And sometimes we're going to make mistakes, right? Sometimes we may take a step too far too early, but I'd really, um, I, I think, you know, just it really encourage folks to not think that if you buy all these tools, you're, you're, the solution is there. It's just, it's too advanced, right? So I agree with you, big area of focus. And I think we need to have a better community 
um, with each other to talk about how do we do this better. I think, again, everyone thinks cyber secret and we need to keep everything very secretive about it. Um, I think we would all do better if we engaged more and collaborated more. So maybe the CIO Association, Sean, should yeah. start a working group around this for all yeah. of us. I would love it. And Rory, that might be another topic for conversation. We could probably do a full hour on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Great insight. Uh, one of the comments I saw in the chat there was um, when Sean, we were talking about your revenue, revenue generating engagements was uh, that's phenomenal, Sean. Right. And I thought, I thought the same thing. Um, and then, and then Tara, one of the, one of the follow-up questions I had for you was just, um, do we expect these shifts to change post pandemic that we're making right now in, in how quickly we're moving stuff? And I think you kind of answered that question a little bit and I don't think it's going to slow down anytime soon. Right. Yeah. So Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate appreciate the conversation. It's really good. Well, the pandemic has propelled companies to the technology tipping point, and many organizations accelerated digital transformation much sooner than anticipated. We'd like to hear from the audience regarding how their company is leaning on technology. So for our next poll question, what technologies is your company leveraging to enable positive cultural and business transformation? So you should see four options on your screen there cloud infrastructure, artificial intelligence, business intelligence, or modernizing network infrastructure. And we'll give everybody a, a few seconds to, uh, to weigh in there. So, Let's jump into our, our next topic. Um, and I'd love for Tara to lead this one and it'd be great to hear Marty's perspective on it as well. So our next topic is, which technologies are being used and how are they applied to enable a positive cultural and business transformation? So Tara, if you don't mind, can you kick us off? Yeah, I, I was looking at the notes I'd made and I'm gonna probably throw them out and <laughs> start the convert, and I do that, just get scared, Rory. Uh, but based on the conversation and, and I think about if I were to provide advice to your audience, I think you have to start at that network. Um, and and I, you know, when we look at our airport and we look at what's coming, it's all about data and, and connectivity and um, to Mark's comment, bandwidth, right? So we're really wanting to become through our innovation expansion and our strategy, um, uh, uh, you know, the airport of the future. And for us, that means IoT everywhere, right? That means sensors that are managing all of our equipment, our devices, our HVAC. Um, think of that bandwidth requirement, right? We, we, we're looking at um, on-demand um, services to, to lessen our um, footprint from a, you know, a sustainability and a gas and fuel perspective, and eventually autonomous vehicles. And, and not just for shuttles and uh, parking services and that, but you know, we want to be bold and, and look at airside, right? And, and in Europe, some of the airports are using autonomous vehicles to actually take the plane out onto the tarmac. And that allows you know you to save some fuel, right? So you don't have to taxi for as long. And so anything we can do around sustainability is a big uh, long-term commitment to us. Uh, for for me, that it's it's all about that network and that and that fiber um, environment. And I know we all talk about Wi-Fi and five G. And my my colleague at Telus will say, "Oh, it's all about five G." But I, but I think you need the fiber. And and Alberta is in a challenging spot for us out here in in Leduc. We do have some issues. Um, our staff have some issues. So I think think about that strategy. Think about how you're going to build that infrastructure. Um, and make sure that you're positioned to enable. And, and then, you know, cloud, right? Um, and I, I was, I'm a big proponent of cloud in the right place, uh, but make sure you're internet ready. So those technologies you select have to be built for the internet. Don't take your legacy stuff and move it. It will hurt. It will hurt you terribly from an OPEX perspective and a, and a management perspective. Um, so when, when I think about technology, I think about um, applying it carefully, piloting things. And then one of the other, I think, more strategic things we're doing is looking at where can we partner and harmonize services. So some of the work um, that we're doing right now is in collaboration with the, major, the other major airports, so Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, and ourselves, 
are partnering on an RFP, which is out on the street for anyone who's interested, around check-in services. So why, why does every airport think they should be different, right? Um, so we're actually looking to um, engage one vendor and create that standardized experience and that standardized technology footprint across all the major airports. And that's really, again, to build, build confidence back as people start to travel again. So lots of things that are happening with us, but for Marty, um, really interested in hearing from you what you're doing and, and any advice. I always like to think of these forums as an opportunity for advice to the participants and to our audience that you would give to the folks watching us. Yeah, thanks, Darren. Um, um, definitely want to pick up on, on a lot of the conversation that has happened already and, and, and some of the trends I've seen in terms of um, technologies being uh, used as enablers of business and, and cultural transformation. So I think in my mind, there are, there are three pieces that we've been working on a lot with our clients, um, particularly over the last 14 months and um, process automation. Um, ERP or financial system transformation, and then enhancing data and analytics capability. And as I kind of walk through those three, um, we're seeing a lot of uptake in process automation. Um, interestingly, not as not as a cost takeout, but more as an, an employee engagement uh, tool, right? And, and so freeing up your employees, creating capacity, moving them off of manual paper-based tasks um, and, and using process automation to be able to do that and getting them focused on, on the things that humans are good at and the things that machines are good at. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, again, this is really about freeing up capacity. And, and a lot of times we're seeing this process automation play, particularly with organizations that um, aren't ready maybe to move off of legacy systems. Maybe it's too risky, too costly, you know, the, the organization can't endure the change at the moment. And so um, we're seeing process automation being done. Um, and to your point, Tara, on those good pilot projects, quick speed to value, um, that where you can start to build that momentum in the organization and for people to recognize the value of these technologies. Um, on the ERP side, um, I think a lot of uh, the pandemic brought this to the fore, I think, for a lot of clients. Um, but also uh, the way the technology is moving uh, more towards the cloud. And so uh, as all of you tech, uh, IT leaders would be aware is that more and more technology vendors are, are who were traditionally on-prem or started as cloud are obviously trying to push to this cloud subscription-based model. And so you've got a lot of organizations with um, on-premise systems that are coming to end of support and they're kind of being forced into the decision um, to transition off of their, their ERP or financial um, system. And, and again, taking that as a, not just a technology exercise, but as a reason to transform. Um, and then the last piece being the enhanced data and analytics capability. Um, and so getting in uh, those more flexible, scalable data platforms and really exploiting the data that you have in your organization. So I, I saw an interesting statistic the other day that 73% of existing business data so data that is sitting within your business is unused and, um, and not being exploited to either identify risk or exploit opportunity. And so, you know, it's all being driven by how do, how do we generate more insight? Um, and the other piece of it is, is how do we compete with those born digital firms, right? Who, who this is a much easier proposition because they were digital from the beginning. They've been collecting this data. It's just how they do business. So, Kind of passing it back to you, Tara, I was interested in some of the, um, the pieces you were talking about, about uh, putting into the operations some more, um, some more of these technologies. Um, what it sounds like is to be able to create new sources of data or collect uh, sources of data that maybe were harder to get at before. Maybe if you could talk a little bit more about you know, what some of those initiatives look like in terms of data creation, which you're using to drive uh, insights. Sure, yeah. So, so kind of two things we're looking at, um, I'm going to say a autonomous uh, airport, right? So can we automate with action, uh, very much to what you're talking about, case management tools and process automation, um, the insights that sort of the administrative activities, right, and, and drive efficiency. Um, on, on the flip side, though, we want to leverage information um, to, to really grow our ancillary revenues. 
So part of our mandate is to uh, diversify our revenues and to help address the costs of the capital intensiveness of our um, sector. So leveraging information around our passengers um, to, to improve the flow, to improve their experience as well, mm. and potentially offer them, you know, uh, cheap Starbucks as they're, as they're <laughs> waiting for their bag, et cetera, right? Uh, uh, so, so we're looking at all of those types of things. So thanks, Marty. Awesome. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it back to Rory. I think we're going to head into the next polling question. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks very much, both of you guys. It's some great insights and really good information. Um, I don't know if there is such thing as cheap Starbucks, is there? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's great. So uh, let's so let's jump in the next poll polling question. So as we move into our final topic for today, how the increasing reliance on technology spurred digital transformation to meet new business demands, we'd like to hear from the audience with our final poll. The question is, what emerging or growing technologies do you think companies will adopt for the re remainder of this year and into 2022? Our options are 5G, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, or blockchain. And we'll give everybody a little bit of time to, uh, to weigh in on this one. And while you're answering that, we are we are going to have some Q and A at the end. So if there are some questions, feel free to drop them into the into the Q and A, and we'll get to as many questions as we can uh, at the end of the conversation here. All right. So we're going to move into our final topic for this afternoon. And, and Marty, I'd really appreciate it if you can lead the topic on this one, and then we're going to open it up to to everyone that's on the panel to to weigh in as well. So. The final topic is for the remainder of this year and into 2022, what should companies expect when implementing and executing new and emerging technologies? Marty, can you kick us off? Yeah, sure. Thanks, for I kind of want to. I want to take this this question from a little bit of a different point of view in terms of what I see as the key considerations and and um, um, key success factors that I've seen working with my clients and and going through some of these information. So. Um, when we think about using technology as an enabler, um, it's, it's transformation is about not just putting in technology, but again, the whole, the whole thing we've been talking about is like, how do we change our culture and the way we really do business? Um, and so when we think about using enabling technologies, start from what are our strategic outcomes that we're looking to achieve? What are the business problems or challenges that we're trying to address? And that really should be the starting point of, of any technology enablement, because if you lose sight of that, you'll probably end up at the end of an implementation with, uh, with an unsatisfied user base and an organization that feels like they haven't achieved um, ROI. Um, I think another part of it is around, uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of technology initiatives that my team and I work on, um, it's all about getting better access to data. And, and even when you're improving processes using things like, like RPA or other process automation, it's, all, it's about not just about improving that process, but digitizing that data. And so how are we ultimately creating this data, creating information and insight ultimately to drive a decision making? And so as I think back to some of the things that Mark talked about around, you know, how United Way is thinking about how do they better engage the donor? Um, I heard Sean talk about how are we better engaging our members and customers and providing value added service. Tara is talking about how do we better uh, engage with passengers and give them a better passenger experience. And so a, a lot of these initiatives are driven around how do we get access to that data um, to be able to make those decisions around how do we better interact with our stakeholders, customers, members, um, passengers, employees. Um, and so that's a, that's a key part of it. And then the other part is um, um, a very, and probably the most important piece is the change management. And um, I think, you know, the, the point was brought up around, uh, you know, is the art organizations ready for the level of change? And Sean, I think I heard you say that, you know, the rapid pace and, and the amount of change is it, it becomes tiring. And, and I think change fatigue is, is, it's real. And so as you think about um, how to deploy these programs, um, thinking about is the organization ready? Um, and sometimes the organization is ready, but there are better times than others. Um, you know, is, is how much change have you pushed on to the organization already? Um, and, and is your organization ready for another set of change? Um, because I think 
you know, while while employees have felt more engaged and maybe feeling a bit of uh, better work-life balance, I think there has been a lot of burnout um, as well resulting from the pandemic. And, and a lot of the time that we thought we saved from commuting and, and you know, in my case, driving back and forth to clients, that time has just been sucked up doing more work, right? And so um, um, I, I think, you know, change fatigue is, has become even come more to the forefront. And then I think the last, the last point I'll make around this is um, the strategic use of partners in your technology implementations or, or your business transformation. Um, and so, you know, making sure that you and your organization are focusing on what you do best and where do we strategically bring in partners to assist us um, um, to be able to, whether it's implement, implement um, to envision the change, um, you know, taking a look at that. A lot of the discussions I've been having with my clients is, is, is really centered around how do we get that strategic um, set of partners that we can reach out to as we're going through these business and, and um, transformation. So um, I just want to, I want to toss it back to, to Mark a little bit to maybe talk about, maybe jump back to the data question and, and um, maybe you can tell us some more, Mark, about, you know, what United Way is doing around the donor experience and, and how you're trying to get access to some better data or exploit the data that you, that you already have in-house. Yeah, and maybe just before I do that, Marty had written four things that I expected with uh, with this question, and you nailed all four perfectly. So there you awesome. go, <laughs> especially with respect to the uh, rapid set of change. So on the on the data side, um, so the idea here is to get into the heads of our donors. What's motivating them? What are their preferences? And um, and it's and it's varied, and we have a lot of gut experiences with um, with where our donors are, where their head is, but I think we need to question that, and uh, and 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 really uh, tackle that, um, and and do that with massive data sets, and be able to use some of the new um, uh, data science uh, and uh, apply data science and, and test our assumptions. Um, to the extent we can get inside the head of our donors, we'll be able to then satisfy our investments and our portfolios and. And and understand the impact that we're making, and if that impact is 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 uh, addressing exactly what our donors are wanting us to do, which is to make an impact. Um, so I think uh, never before I would suggest have we had an opportunity to to do that, to be able to collect the data that we that we need to, and then be able to analyze it. And from that analyzing, then we can look at our strategies and see if our strategies are aligned to where our impact is. And this is all data driven. And, and, it, and I believe that, that this is the opportunity. Um, and, and also to the extent that we support our, um, uh, we're an umbrella organization and we support a, a number of different not-for-profits. Are, are, they, are they making an impact such that it justifies our investment in those other, in, in, in the not-for-profit community in that ecosystem as well, and being able to, 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 to understand if our measurements are correct. This is all data-driven. Uh, you said that 70% of the data isn't being used. I would suggest 100% you're correct. Um, and, and, and I think that uh, we can even add to that as well. Awesome, awesome. Mm -hmm. um, all the stuff we're talking about, and, and we mentioned a little bit around change management. I think I think Sean may want to kind of get lend some insight into around that. And, and with you know with the, the changes we're talking about coming now and into 2022, I think the change management is going to be a big piece around that. Yeah, you know, Marty, I'm really glad that you brought up change management because I think, and, and I'll even go one step further and qualify it as organizational change management. I think that. Uh, it gets overlooked. I can't. I can't count on two hands how many times that organizations will cut that out of the budget of a project, and everything lives and breathes on organizational change management. The success of digital transformation is on the change management aspect. So, you know, I'm not just talking when it comes to implementing technology and you send out a notice at 4 p.m. We're going to switch over to this technology. That that's change management. But that's technical change management. What I'm talking about is, you know, how the organization clearly defines the change and how it lines to business strategic goals, the impacts of those that are affected, the communication strategy. I mean, you can't overstate communications enough. 
uh, effective training for employees. I, I think that this, this rate of change and the pace of change and the employees and, uh, and staff are just like getting thrown all these new things. It needs to be thought out. And then what does it look like post-change support? Like who's managing it afterwards? Because I think a lot of people think that you've implemented something and you know, can wipe my hands away, we did our job, but no, you have to support that. And then finally, how do we measure that change? And I think somebody mentioned it on the, on the topic, uh, but maybe not, but you know, how do we know if we succeeded? How do we know that the solution that we put in place that we either rammed in place because it was a three day, four day implementation, or is a couple months implementation or a year? How do we know that we actually succeeded? So I think that um, I cannot um, stress the importance of organizational change management, whatever you have to do to get it in the budget of your project. If you want that project to succeed, you know, there's a big percentage that organizational change management and we've lived it and breathed it and we've done it without, and we've seen the effects on both sides. And I could tell you hands down, organizational change management wins every time. Yeah, well said, Sean, well said. Um, before we jump into some q and I'd love to get Tara's take on it. And I know, Tara, that, that the airports are going through uh, a lot of change and you talked about automation and, and, and IoT and all that, all that. So I'd love to get your take a little bit on, on what you're expecting to see from implementing all these technologies over the next year. Yeah, well, well yeah, I'm maybe to step a little bit away from sort of the implementation, but to kind of follow up on some of my colleagues' comments, I, I think what 2022 is going to be about is all about the employee, and and I I, I worry for our staff. I worry for my colleagues. You know, um, are we providing the services that we need to for that at home work? You know, do do they know how to set up their routers and are you know are are we supporting them right? So so I think we have to remember that employees are our most important customer for all of us, right? And and so I think that's going to be a big piece. And then when I think about technology and emerging technologies and, you know, innovation, um, you know, start small and test and fail and go again. Uh, be careful who you partner with. Um, I know that, Marty, you talked about uh, integrators and partners on, in that aspect, but there's a lot of great innovation out there and great product, but can they scale, right? Can you operationalize that? And so I think there's going to have to be a balance and, and make sure you understand that balance from an investment perspective. Um, and, and, you know, uh, again, make sure you have an agile platform to begin with, right? So no one can fix or, or do these wonderful things on, a, on sort of a fragile foundation. So, you know, don't forget table stakes is, is sort of my, my best advice to all of you. Fantastic. Well, we do have some time left. Uh, so why don't we take a look at some questions for the audience? And, and, and Tara, there's one here actually that goes out to you. So the, so the question is, we're noticing enormous growth in, in digitization within many sectors, including airports. The impact of digitization, digitization is transforming how we and our employees work today. Oops, lost it. <laughs> many times it's difficult for people to change accordingly or even challenge the status quo. How is this being handled in your organization? What cultural changes are being implemented? Uh, really great question. Um, so first, first of all, I'm a really lucky person. Um, our organization, they're just all innovative by nature. They're all entrepreneurs, which is just cool, right? Um, but I'd say spend a lot of time on building relationships. So, uh, you know, I've been at the airport in a whole new sector for me previously in, in regulation and oil and gas. Um, and I spent a lot of time trying to understand the business and really listening to them. Don't jump in and do that first 90 days nonsense that people tell you to do. Um, you know, respect your colleagues and learn and build those relationships of trust. I, I think that's the key thing. Um, and, and try to find things that actually help them make their jobs easier, right? So your job is to enable. It's not to be on, on, on a panel. It's not to get an award. It's to enable the business to get a better, more efficient outcome. Fantastic. We have another few questions here. So one of the questions that sticks out to me is, could you please shed some light on the top three things to keep in mind when while implementing new technologies? Why don't I throw this one out to Sean? Sean, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, 
just think you're still on yeah, mute. Sorry, you. repeat that question again. Roy. Could you please shed some light on the top three things to keep in mind while implementing new technologies? Well, I think the top one, uh, change management right off the bat. I think that, you know, I've already spoken at length about that. Um, <clears throat> I think just to, um, I'll even recap what Tara said, ensuring that you are trying to solve a business stakeholder problem, putting their agenda ahead of yours. And then I think the third, whatever we do should be in alignment to the organization's strategy. So it's kind of number two and number three, both kind of align. Um, it's not about us. And I, I love how Tara said, um, how Tara articulated that. Um, it is truly about our stakeholders and we need to enable them and we have to put their needs above our own, even though we might have a recommendation or whatnot. But um, yeah, those would be the top three things. Awesome, thanks, Sean. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, of course, Mark. Um, oh, I think you're on mute there, Mark. I, I, uh, I went off mute and I went on mute. It's all about the user experience, ironically. Um, as I was, as I was speaking in, in a, in a dead, in a dead room. Um, no, it's, I, I think we really need to understand the user experience of our employees, of our clients, of our stakeholders. And, and we, we, uh, we need to appreciate not just the rate of change that they're, uh, undertaking, but how to, how to make, how to make experiences invisible or seamless. Um, and I don't think we spend enough time. Uh, considering uh, considering just that the the experience of the employees, the experience of our stakeholders, and um, and I think we need to invest some time in and thinking around that because if something is hard to do, if there's any barriers in being able to move forward, and those barriers could include bandwidth, or they could include they could include a lack of training or or whatever. But we need to we need to query and question those whom we're, we're working with and learn from them and spend some time on that as well. Absolutely, well said, Mark. Um, one of our other questions here is, where do you see the opportunities to upskill your technology teams internally? How has that pandemic affected your ability to train and equip your teams to develop and successfully retrain your talent? Which I think is a great question. I think we're all struggling with that right now. So um, any insight on, Marty, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's a good question, I, and I and I don't want to cop out of this, but again, I, I want to pass this back to the panelists who are actually leading um, IT teams um, um, within their organizations. Like my 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 perspective is an as a, as an external advisor, but um, I think that like to to make it short, I think there's you know once you start. Um, implementing these technologies, and and when we go through a technology implementation with um, with a client. One of the things that we that we sort of plead for is someone to come on the journey with us, right? And I think that's part of um, doing a successful technology implementation when you're using a partner is is bringing um, bringing the, that's part of bringing the organization along with us. And so it's not just about us going off into a black box and, and sort of developing and coming back and 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 throwing a solution at the client. It's about that client being part of the solution part of the knowledge transfer and coming along the journey. So obviously there's some upfront training that needs to happen from a formal perspective, whether whatever vendor or technology that we're using that they'll go through. But this is really about getting um, someone engaged on that project with us as a lead, um, sort of getting into the trenches and really understanding what's the solution design. And, and again, what are the outcomes we're striving for at the end of the project? But I'll also pass it back to the other panelists to talk about, you know, how they're how they're um, how they're managing this with their own teams and their organizations as well. I'll, I'll go and, and just have a little bit of perspective on this. I think, you know, what I've seen, I've, I've managed technology teams that uh, have been insourced and have been outsourced, and I've been, you know, pretty negative towards outsourcing in the past. But what I've seen, you know, market wise, is outsourcing strategically outsourcing key elements of your organization have been, um, I think, adding a tremendous amount of value because there's no value in keeping the lights on. I know Tara said it earlier that, you know, there's some operational table stakes you have to do, like the CEO's laptop has to work. If it's not working, it doesn't matter what digital transformation project you've got going on because it doesn't matter. Um, we've been able to strategically outsource some of our lights on activities. And what that's done is allowed us to 
focus on my team to focus on value creation you know, within the organization so that we can think and act more tact or more strategic about some of the initiatives that we've got going on as an organization instead of being head down in the weeds where there's no value so we've been able to upskill some of our employees by um putting them in new positions and more elevated positions that are interfacing more with the business from a strategic perspective instead of you know dealing with you know, fixing my laptop or it being broken, it's taken care of by somebody else now. So that's one of the areas that, that we've uh, seen some real good value in. That's brilliant. Can I jump in, Rory? Can, do, Absolutely, do I, Tara. Yeah, so, so I think maybe on the flip side around your staff, you know, think about soft skills, think about conflict management, think about negotiation and give them career paths, right? So there's some great um, programs out there right now, folks, especially um, we're using the Canada Job Grant for a lot of training, and it, it's just an amazing program that that really supports that certification path for folks. So, so in, in, ensure that, but then mentor them. Uh, I, I think often we give people training and we expect them to somehow uh, come back to the office and understand how to, how to uh, project manage, right? It's all about experiential learning, right? So get some good senior people and make sure part of their role is to mentor others. You got to do that. I couldn't agree more, Tara. Especially in this in this in this world now, where you don't have the luxury of learning through osmosis by sitting beside each other anymore, right? So, so having that mentor, having somebody to kind of tag along with, is is invaluable in this virtual world that we're living in right now, for sure. So. Any other comments at all from everybody? We've got a couple minutes left before before we're at the end of our time. Yeah, Rory, I wouldn't mind just piping back in, and I and again, this is back, to, uh, back to a point that that Tara made, and especially when you're thinking about emerging technologies that that your organization might not be um, exposed to, and and getting those right pilots and proof of concepts is key, right? And and we've actually gotten to a position now where we're working with clients not to go big bang and really trying to focus on them and on, on what is that pilot um, instead of doing all six integrations in, in a process automation pilot, you know, let's pick one, see how successful we can be at it and how much value we can drive out of it. And, um, and I think that's, that's a very important point is like, don't, don't try to boil the ocean, particularly if it's a, if it's a new technology that you haven't used um, pick, pick, Pick a smaller chunk. It might take you a little longer, but it'll be time well invested and effort well invested to really sort of mitigate some risk and 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 um, help um, help with the success of a of a larger implementation. So I'll just add that as my kind of final point. Absolutely brilliant, Marty. Thanks for that. Well, we're coming to the close, uh, but before we sign off, I again want to thank all of our panelists for the collaboration today. It's been absolutely brilliant and some invaluable information, which I think probably really rang true with, with a lot of people that were on, the, were on the call today. I also want to thank everyone for taking the time out of their day to join us for this event. Um, also, as mentioned at the beginning of the event, today's webinar will be available for on-demand viewing. Um, so follow-up email will be sent with the link uh, to the recording, uh, and that'll be shared out uh, fairly soon. So thanks again to everyone. Really appreciate you taking the time out and, and take care and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.